Welcome, Vulture Aliens, Baked Companions, and Blue Pizza Loving Aliens, to the 294th episode of An Unearthly Podcast, streaming live on the 20th of February, 2019, and featuring the Sarah Jane Adventures Death of the Doctor, written by Russell T. Davies and starring Elizabeth Sladen as Sarah Jane Smith, Tommy Knight as Luke Smith, Clyde Langer, uh, Anjali Mohindra as Rani Chandra, and guest starring Matt Smith as the Doctor. I am Bill Sylvia, the Man in Black, and with me are Mad Matt Winchell. I'm back to my diet, Jolly Good. Andy Ronson McCulloch. I have to go driving after this. Tim the Enchanter Sheridan. It's the wisest and best to focus on the good and the beautiful. And Thomas Fireheart. I almost slept right through this. <laughs> it's my own stupid fault. But Tim, I Tim, I? Tim, I got that Phantom <laughs> the, the Phantom Planet reference there. Oh. <laughs> At uh. least I can sleep as soundly tonight, then. <laughs> Phantom Planet is quilted for softness. <laughs> Right, right now, um, we are getting my favorite weather in the world: freezing rain. God damn it! Oh wow, you're getting it bad down there. Wow. Well, we're supposed to be getting it. I don't know if we're getting it now or we're getting it later, but we're supposed to be getting some. Oh, the, it's I, raining we're not, in New York too. We're not supposed to be getting any of that over here until Saturday. If we get it, still, it depends. It's been a low percentage, oh, no, I think. Saturday, we're supposed to get all kinds of hell. It's... I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure my my Saturday game is going to be canceled. We got an, snow... we got an inch, inch and a half of snow, and plowed it, and then salted it, and it tried to snow again, and it all melted anyways. No, we got three mm. inches down mm. here, and they salted the hell out of it, so the roads were pretty good when I went out to drop Aaron off at work. Mm. But I have to pick her up at 2 a.m. and you know the temperature has now moved down into freezing. So, well, as we'll long see. as they salted it well enough and kept it salted, it should all be fine. Yeah, we'll see. I'm hoping. I am honestly hoping because I've got to. I, like I said, I have to go out and do all this stuff. Mm. Uh, so how's the weather been like elsewhere? Well, it was snowing today, and that's turned into cold rain. And uh, by tomorrow, they say it's going to be in the 60s, and the sun will be shining. Ditto. Hmm. We've, been, we've had something similar to that a couple times. We haven't gotten hmm. 60s. We haven't gotten 60s, but we hit 40s all of a sudden abruptly after bad weather, and then went back to hmm. bad weather. Yep. I am honestly looking forward to the end of February because this has been one March of a February. <laughs> Usually, even March isn't this bad. March is pretty mercurial. It bounces between "Oh my God, it's nice" to "Oh my God, it's crap," which is <laughs> I've always found amusing as hell because that's when they decide to have the uh, the uh, state basketball championships. Mm-hmm. And it That's for everyone out into the rain. It, inevitably, it's a blizzard whenever they have the state basketball championships. <laughs> which, by the way, happens here in Madison, which is why we know about this, because it happens down at the UW Fieldhouse. And so everybody and their, bro and their cousin comes to Madison, and, you know, we're getting snow and freezing rain and all this other wonderful bullshit. <laughs> And we have all the extra hundreds of bodies we need to melt all the snow. <laughs> or at least march <laughs> through it. I, march I honestly it. don't make any serious yeah. plans until April. Because you're reasonably certain you're going to be okay in April. Every now and then you get like the, the, the worst bastard of a winter and you don't actually see warm weather till May. But that's really mm. rare. This year has been, I think, one of our most wettest winters in a while. In a while, yeah. The one Say the that three times fast. Like, what is, like what a, is winters in a while? It's been like a decade since we've had this much snow. Now, you know, I remember, you know, in the 80s and 90s where you could, you know, by the end of the, the winter season, you could go outside and your driveway and your walkway 
is basically a giant canyon. You you feel like you're like walking on Krypton or something because the snow is piled up that high. But I haven't seen one of those in ages. It's this is about as high as it's been in a long time. Anyway, enough enough chit chat about the weather. On tonight's show, we've got news and birthdays. Not a lot of news, a little bit of birthdays. Um, I don't think we have any geek talk because I, I haven't seen anything. Uh, oh, um, oh wait, oh wait, I oh, forgot wait, to so. put it in until today. So <laughs> yeah, but I, okay, I saw there, a movie I see, last I week. Yep. Yeah. I need to go see that. I haven't. Um, Thomas did watch an additional episode of the Sarah Jane Adventures that we've seen and has scored it, so we'll look we will into make that, a that bit. adjustment. And then, of course, we've got our episode review, our episode summary, our review, final thoughts, and ratings. I did recently finish a game, but I'm not going to bring it up other than this quick mention because it's not sci-fi. Okay. <clears throat> so... Starting with birthdays. On Valentine's Day, the 14th of February, we had the birthday of Simon Pegg, who played the editor in the episode The Long Game in 2005. Also played Montgomery Scotty Scott in the J.J. Abrams Star Trek franchise from 2009 to 2016. Mm -hmm. That is dead now, by the way. That particular movie franchise is dead at the moment, yes. yes. It's, it's dead, Jim. Uh, Unkar Plut in Star Wars The Force Awakens, which makes him one of the recipients of the science fiction hat trick. He turned 49. <laughs> Moving forward to the 16th of February was the birthday of Christopher Eccleston, known as, of course, the Doctor from 2005. He turned 55. Also, uh, same day is the birthday of Jeremy Bullock, who played Hal in The Time Warrior, 1974, but is better known as being the suit actor for Boba Fett. Boba Fett. Ugh. Mm -hmm. Also, I think there's a couple of things he's voiced him in, too. I think he used to voice him, and then they replaced his voice. Oh, no, that, that they, was they somebody did. else. Yeah. They, they, no, they, they did. They did, but he uh, the also did some uh, voice work for Boba Fett in something like in the last five years. <clears throat> I checked the IMDb. <laughs> he turned 74. And then finally, today, the 20th of February, the most appropriate birthday we can have is Anjali Mohindra, who plays Rani Chandra in the Sarah Jane Adventures. Uh, she turned 29, which mm -hmm. goes to show how long ago the Sarah Jane Adventures was. Yeah. yeah. And also, this third. means that she's actually older than me. Because <laughs> 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 I turned 29 <laughs> later this year, so. She's Holy older than you by a couple yeah. months. <laughs> yeah, like I said, it still turns my brain, and I, I mentioned this, I think, a week or two ago, that Warwick Davis is younger than me, or, or is only slightly older than me. Mm. Slightly, by like two, three years. I'm like, seriously? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, he started like, acting young. Yes, he did. Because mm. he, was, he was in Jedi, and... You Jedi, know, that wasn't was, he? What? Wasn't he like eight in Jedi? He was in Jedi, yes. Return of the Jedi. He wasn't eight. He was oh, like I mean, 12? he was like extremely... I thought he was younger than that. It was 1983, at which point I was seven years old. It's like... I think he was closer to like eight or ten, yeah. And by, by the way, Return of the Jedi was the movie <clears throat> that got me hooked on Star Wars. I mean, that's what, what got me collecting all the action figures and everything. See, what I got hooked on um, was because my my aunts sat me down and I watched the entire trilogy in one weekend. No, I went to go see Jedi in the theaters. I technically I went to go see I don't think it was around Empire. at the time, so... <laughs> I, I technically went to go see Empire in the theaters. The problem is, I was so young at that point, I could only remember the fight scene between Luke and Vader. I also went to go see Star Trek The Motion Picture in the theaters, and for years afterwards, I swore the movie actually began about halfway through, because apparently I napped through the first half. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, holy shit, he would have been 13 when Empire, uh, when um, Jedi came out. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So he was probably 12 on set. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's just absolutely shocking <clears throat> to me. 
that, you know, somebody that young who's basically, you know, my generation peer um, was in this movie that I was absolutely jacked about as a kid. It just boggles my mind. Anyway, we're not tired to talk about Warwick Davis. We're here to talk about Simon. He's not even. How do we even get on Warwick yeah. Davis? I, I, I don't would, know. He tangented. Uh, it was. It, it was the. It was the. The shock of Thomas that Angeli Mohindra was getting, actually uh, uh, was near his age. Yeah, was older than him, slightly. Mm. Uh, speaking of which, I did a little bit of research while looking up pictures for Angeli. She is still doing a ton of TV stuff. Like she's doing five things this year. Already, yeah, and she's oh, also you know, the lead voice actress for one of the heroes in Dragon's Quest now. Oh, nice. The uh, long running RPG series, and now also uh, uh, oh. Dicey Wars esque series. She's actually she, one of the main she, characters. She was in an episode last year of Legends of Tomorrow. Yep, that too. Oh. She's Play going for the hat trick. She's got a DC now. <laughs> Uh, no, no, the hat trick still still is Star Wars and Star Trek. Mm. <laughs> she, she is still just only a major television actor. Um, yeah, but she has got endless amounts of work to do, apparently. Casualty. Uh, Paranoid. Yeah, the thing is, her, um, her listing on Wikipedia is a little bit... Uh, um, falsifying because it lists stuff by series mm. so the sarah jane adventures um she's listed for series two the comic relief special series three series four and series five I mean, he does all that as too. separate separate entries yeah. which is ah, i gotcha yeah I mean, he does weird. that too but I, I guess it's better than, like, if you look at IMDb, it'll be like Doctor Who 2005. I'm like, they were only in the 2010 season. <laughs> Depends on well, what show that, you're looking that, at. That, that is separating the 2000, Doctor Who 2005 from Doctor Who 1963. Hmm. True. So, you know, it's only the, the when the series began. But it's, you know, if you take a look at the, the running for <laughs> Doctor Who, it's 1963 to 1989. And Which, then by the way, that's weird. To 2018. I don't but, check that because I think on IMDb they list Sarah Jane Adventures uh, individual seasons. Uh, oh, wait, no. They, they got the regular season and then they got the uh, uh, Sarah Jane Adventure Alien Files and a couple extra sides listed mm -hmm. differently. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, the Alien Files was um, basically a little webisode kind of thing. Mm -hmm. mm. Anyway. Anyway, happy birthday to all of them. We'll move into the news now. Yeah. Uh, a lot of nothing until we get to my bit. So, uh, Candy Jar Books has announced the next book in the Laughing Gnome series, Rise of the Dominator. Uh, Rise of the Dominator follows directly from its predecessor, The Danger Men, and deals with Anne Travers and Bill Bishop dealing with a police investigation into the latest criminal kingpin. Laughing Gnome, Rise of the Dominator, is available for pre-order now from the Candy Jar website and is due for release at the end of March. All right. Cool. And, and from, then we... Yeah. From books, we go to games. Games. Coming to ver headsets everywhere, Doctor Who, The Runaway. This 12-minute interactive adventure will include a tour of the TARDIS. Not many more details now, but it's being made by the BIP and Passion Animation Studios, and it'll be coming out soon. It looks nice, at least from the picture yeah. we're able to get. It, it looks yeah. nice. We don't know much. It has a plot. We know that much. <laughs> Which they usually try to squeeze something in, yeah. But other than that, we don't know much of anything. Other than yeah. it's coming soon, TM. Mm -hmm. Soon. <laughs> For anyone who didn't catch that, that was virtual reality. Yes. Yes, that's what VR is. VR, well, virtual it, it wasn't pronounced as VR, is why I said that. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> Tim pronounced it in a way that would have gotten him fired from a newsroom. 
for the verb. Well, then uh, I'll, I'll go and start my own newsroom, and it'll be better, and it'll have gambling and hookers. And blackjack and hookers. Blackjack. Blackjack. <laughs> you know what? Screw it. Forget the blackjack. <laughs> <laughs> News ah! and hookers. Wait, don't they already have that in the internet? Ah, forget it all. Mm. Yeah. Of Tommy Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and from there we have our last piece of news. And we'll finish. Yes, uh, our big finish for the news. Ah, that pun always gets old. Okay. <laughs> uh, the new series of Torchwood continues in Gods Among Us Two, out today. Four new episodes, including Flight 405 by Lou Morgan, Hostile Environment by Ash Darby, News by Tim Foley, and Eye of the Storm by David Llewellyn. Torchwood uh, Gods Among Us 2 is available now from Big Finish for 28 pounds CD, 25 download. And there is our completely unprofessional news. I think the pound <laughs> keeps going down because of Brexit, so yeah, Americans <laughs> buy it. <laughs> uh, oh, that that lost rider's name i i just have to know that it's probably like Huehuin or something like that because like welsh is i don't know every weird. time I've heard somebody it looked it up and said it was llewellyn i thought yeah every time i've heard mm. it pronounced on british tv it's always been i'm yeah. pretty sure mm -hmm. whoever whoever um bts for uh a big finish yeah, the BTS for Big Finish, Llewellyn. I don't think it's Nick Briggs, but uh, okay. it has a very similar voice. Mm. Barely tell people apart at the best of times. <laughs> yeah, you all seem to have that issue. <laughs> Unfortunately, the Wikipedia entry for the name Llewellyn does not actually give mm. how it's pronounced. <laughs> yeah. I guess it depends on if he is Welsh or not. Um, as far pretty as sure it's it, Welsh. I'm pretty sure it's Welsh. Mm. It's like I'm used to like L L Y N is Huyn, as far as I know. Mm. Whereas if uh, if it were Spanish, it would be Yewijin. It, it might be the. <laughs> or depending on your accent, it might be Yewijin. It might be the difference <laughs> between how the Welsh pronounce it to each other and how. Yeah, the true. That's the Welsh yeah. Names because there was a character in um the christmas invasion whose last name was llewellyn and was un was pronounced llewellyn hmm. yeah mm -hmm. uh but the way you say that i uh, i've known one person who has a german name and one person who has an italian name and both of them have just given up and started pronouncing it the english way because they realized they were never going to convince people the right way to pronounce it well you know <laughs> how many american names are bastardizations of their european names mm -hmm. Because <laughs> the people here in America refused to pronounce it the way it should have. Come to think of it, now that I say that, in high school I knew somebody who was uh, Portuguese and pronounced his name as if, you know, it, out of the Portuguese way because he just was not up to explaining it to people. Yeah. <laughs> my, my mother's family name um, was originally Caillou, C-A-L-L-I-E-A-U. It was French. Mm-hmm. Uh, when they moved from France to Canada, like way back in like the 1700s, uh, that name got bastardized down to Kaya. C -A the Canadians speak French. They also speak uh, English. Quebecans do, yes. Well, it's one of the official languages of all of France. Mm. Uh, Acadians in particular had that issue, and that was the society that was there at the time. Mm. But, I guess yeah, at least... They, in but somewhere along the way, uh, it got bastardized to Kaya, C-A-Y-A. And yeah, that's what my family's, that's what my mother's family's been called ever since. So it happens. Mm. It happened a lot during the 19th century with people coming through Ellis Island. My last name is Dutch. Mm. <laughs> um. Explains why one of my aunts had wooden shoes. <laughs> anyway I'm not even uh, joking the next, the next sec section we have tonight is we do have a score edition change oh, um, yep. Thomas did see uh, Sarah Jane Adventures The Gift 
and has retroactively given it a 4.0. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, like, I was, it's funny because it's an episode where, like, you can totally see the twist, mm. or, like, a story where you can kind of see that the <laughs> twist is, but it's still, like, eh, I still enjoyed it. Okay, um, so, the original rating between everybody was a 3.63. Adding the 4, we'll hop that to a 3.7. So it might jump slightly in the ratings. We'll take a look later. Mm -hmm. From there, we go to our Geek Talk section. Yep. Where, once again, Thomas has seen a movie that the rest <laughs> of us haven't, and we hate yeah. him for it. <laughs> um, it's actually funny because I saw this uh, the day I arrived in... My state capital of yeah, Brisbane. On planet. Oh, uh, <laughs> because like I I arrived because I I took the train down because I didn't want to have to deal with the weather crap. But of course, a flood happened up north, so that didn't help either. The the train had all the switch it. But anyway, um, I had to kill some time once I actually got there. I was allowed to leave my luggage at the the hotel, but it's like yeah, we can't sign you in until two in the afternoon so i was like well shit i might as well just go into the city and then i realized oh wait there's a cinema in here i can just go see a movie that'll kill time easy so <laughs> i almost saw aquaman again i must admit but that <laughs> didn't start until like quarter to one in the afternoon uh alita battle angel started at 12 30 so i was like fuck it i'll go to that um and yeah um i have as a uh, disclaimer, I've not read the manga. I have not watched the. It's either an anime series or an OVA series. I forget which, but generally uh, this, I have. Technically speaking, a OVA can be an anime. But yes, well, I it's, think it's I, OVAs can be a series. Yes. I think Alita yeah. was both a uh, anime movie and an OVA, ah, if okay. I recall. I um, think they eventually it, took the OVA and condensed it into a movie. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, but generally, I haven't seen any of that. So, um, whereas I know, I mean, I've seen people who have who liked it and people who have who hadn't. But I don't have that as a reference. So, um, honestly, I, I enjoyed the movie for what it was. Um, you can tell in places that it's very heavily condensing stuff but other than that uh the acting's fine the uh, I, <coughs> I feel like the cg for alita herself in some cases is a bit awkward where it looks like you can't tell if she's supposed to be looking at something specifically or if she's just kind of staring off into nothing <laughs> Um, but aside, that aside, it's fine. Um, plus it kind of makes sense that she's supposed to be like a, she's supposed to stand out as a cyborg or whatever anyway. So it's like, okay. Um, the, I guess the funny thing is I actually kind of got, um, Astro Boy vibes. Like this is a more like gritty Astro Boy <laughs> in a weird way. Uh, That's like, not, not entirely like, untrue. Yeah, like, not like a one-to-one -one comparison, but, mm -hmm. you know, there's, like, elements here and there that's, like, okay, I can kind of see where people could make a connection there. Um, and without, I mean, I'll put it this way, this movie better hope it makes its money back, because they sequel bait. <laughs> yeah, I heard of that much, at um, least. So, yeah, um... I honestly hope it does well enough to warrant a sequel because I would like to. And this is one of like that actually threw me off when it happened at first because I was like, wait, I thought people were complaining because it seemed like they tried to condense everything into this one movie. Um, but I'm also kind of glad they didn't at the same time. I, <laughs> like, I the, don't the, know. The, is the, the manga actually finished yet? <laughs> um... Is it another one of those work in progress stills? 
Still time? Uh, I don't know. I think it was no, just that they Bonga didn't. Bonga originally ended in 1995. It did finally right. end in 95 officially. Okay. Yes. Um. So yeah, I think it was just that they were like, okay, we're gonna have to cram a lot into this, but we don't want to like condense everything. No, that'd be so... ridiculous. You'll never fit everything, especially something that long. Yeah, especially without like it'd just be like bastardized essentially if you tried to cram absolutely everything into one movie so i can give them credit for not but at the same time the way it ends almost seems like we're going into the final act so it's like okay wait what <laughs> well i can tell you this um the original run of alita <laughs> ran for that but it spawned a lot of sequels mm. Mm. So it's quite possible they finished what was in the original run of the manga. So they probably finished the an original then, arc, but they haven't finished but like they, all they the side stuff yet. Bait for like Last Order, which is considered its sequel. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Either way, I, I would definitely say it's worth uh, seeing. Um, of course, the funny thing is, the day I saw it was technically uh, Valentine's Day. Um, which is kind of funny, especially because that was actually <laughs> What was that? Hello? Did we lose Thomas? We might have. Let me have a look here. Hmm. No, he's still here. He's still, still here, but not lighting up, so maybe it's a connection issue. It quite possibly is a connection issue. Um, we're having all kinds of con we're all having all kinds of technical fun tonight, folks. <laughs> oh yeah. We we started half hour late because Bill couldn't get his headset to work, and <laughs> I showed up and I couldn't even talk because for a reason Discord wasn't reading me right. Yeah, it was. It's been one of these nights. Okay. Just why I'm kind of pushing to get this done with. <laughs> it, it wasn't even the headset. It was that the download Discord wouldn't work, so I had to use the browser version, which I never use, and therefore the settings were not set up. Mm. And it was settings for 10 minutes. <laughs> hmm. Okay. By the way, you're constantly broadcasting right now. Oh, the vine just stopped. <laughs> what? You're constantly broadcasting. When you keep seeing the green circle around you, that means you're still audio audible. When I'm talking, right? Yeah. Or slightly slightly after, it seems. That's odd. It seems to last a while after, yeah. <clears throat> anyway. Anyway, um, talking yeah, talking yeah. about the manga. Oh, there's uh, a Thomas. Mars yeah, Chronicle my fucking as as per usual, my fucking laptop decides. No, I'm not going to warn you that the battery is low and you need to plug your charger in. It just cuts out. <laughs> mm. Oh, joy! So, uh, thankfully, it was quick enough to restart. But fucking Jesus, I need to like just preemptively check it every five. I, minutes. I think you should like, just preemptively plug it in as you're starting the stream. Yeah. Well, that's just I, it. I had it plugged in as we were starting, so it was fully charged then. So it's annoying. Nah, I would never um, trust it that long. <laughs> yeah. Not, not laptop. Um, <laughs> mm. Anyway, but, um, uh, what is what is your final verdict on? Uh, um, I would definitely say yeah. Like I would definitely say go see it. I mean, even if you don't like come out of it thinking it's great, I would still say it's worth seeing because I. I honestly had no hype for it, and I still came out enjoying it, so yeah. That's um, kind of what I've been hearing, too, is that people are actually legit worried that it's not going to get the views it should, despite being one of the best anime adaptations. Wait, is everyone hearing Thomas except for me? <laughs> yeah, apparently. It might be because not I... Not muted either. Like, the I the way know. I cut I don't out, I understand. guess. <laughs> God damn it, Bill. Oh, that's I'll, very, I'll very quickly leave and rejoin and see if that does something for her. I guess I gotta try, yeah. Did Ed that does... help? Mm. <coughs> Can you hear, now hear him? Okay. okay. Okay, there we go. Yeah, it must have just been because of how my laptop Yes, died. let's hurry this so long before not something else happens and dies. 
Okay. <laughs> Sounds like a good yeah, idea. Uh, by the way, uh, quickly, uh, the budget for uh, Alita was two hundred million gross, one hundred and seventy net. It has mm. thus far made one hundred and forty point two million. So, so it's getting close. Mm, we'll see if yeah. it manages to make its money yeah. back. It From what a... I heard, it has to make five hundred mil. That's going to be hard pressed. Yeah. We'll see how it does in the next couple of weeks here. Why? In the see, that's. I think it's an advertising budget. It's oh, advertising like budget because you, 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 because they never 500. ever give you the public advertising budget, right. but you have to assume by yeah. depending on how much they put on it. Just put more. They just put so much into it that there's no chance for it to make it back. Half the time, yeah. Yeah, if a movie doesn't make three times its budget these days, it's not a success. Mm -hmm. unlike, because unlike because all that extra days. budget was put into advertising then, and the advertisements with the no nothing. And then they put so much money into it that there's no way for it to possibly make three times its budget. Yeah. The only way that a movie will lose money and still get a sequel made is if it wins awards. It, uh, if it wins awards or next... if another country likes it so much that they will actually ship out money to that studio to get the mm -hmm. next movie made. Although I imagine if it's um if the movie is actually a two hour toy commercial, um uh, and Hasbro <laughs> or Bandai or whoever makes a shit ton of money off of it, and continues to fund those movies, that's also another thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's that's possible as well. But um, yeah, well, you it's... Michael Bay. <laughs> yeah, I will just quickly throw in that the reason that I did go away last week was because I was going to the first concert I'd ever been to, oh dear. Uh, which was for the online, uh, like they're mostly known through because of the internet. Um, I've heard uh, of them before. Ninja, yes. <laughs> yeah. Ninja sex party was the band and a band from Canada called, um, they just called like twerp for short now, but the, the abbreviation is for Tupperware remix party. They opened it. And honestly, <laughs> Considering there's not, it's like a concert. There's not much to really say, but honestly, it was a really enjoyable experience, and I will most likely see them the next time they come through Australia because they okay. sold out every show. So here, here's some interesting little bit of data for you. Um, Alita was number one in the box office last weekend, Woo. but last weekend was the worst President's Day weekend in 15 years. Wow. <laughs> so. Movies were down all over. Movies were and... down all over, but she managed to climb to the top, though. So, mm -hmm. kudos on that, at least. Now, if they can keep mm -hmm. the momentum on the top and get a better weekend. Uh, Elite Advantage will top the weekend box office with ease, outperforming expectations and delivering an estimated $27.8 million over the three-day weekend to hit over $33 million for the four-day weekend. So... They're, it's doing a better than their predictions, but it was just a very low uh, budget weekend. Yeah. So yeah, hopefully they can again they can keep that momentum up and they'll keep getting more people yeah. in those seats. Especially considering it's coming out like what a, maybe a week and a half or two weeks before How to Train Your Dragon Three comes out in the U.S. Oh yeah, that, that's gonna be a stomper. So, yeah. <laughs> That's going to be the biggest challenge for Alita is uh, fighting yeah. with uh, How to Train Your Dragon. It's also kind of a low. It's also kind of a low season for films right now. I mean, mm. normally there would be like a Marvel movie out. And... That'd be like the only thing that got any hype. Yeah, and the Marvel's Nor been quiet. Normally right now. there would probably still be a uh, a Star Wars movie at the tail end of its time. Yeah, that or, too, and or... they've had to suspend stuff there as well. Mm. Or, Although or technically there is a Marvel movie out because uh, Spider Verse is dangling right now. Although it's not at times that are convenient for me to get to. <laughs> um. So yeah, movies coming uh. that's been out thus far. Um, for geek movies, Lego Movie Two and this and Alita is basically it right now. This mm. year, How to Train Your Dragon comes out on the twenty second. Captain Marvel comes out March eighth. And yeah, that'll draw some people. Yeah. And then Shazam comes out April fifth, and that'll draw some people. Hmm. And they'll only have like three weeks to Wait, try and make so their money before, before Endgame. Game. Yeah. yeah. 
DC Captain Marvel and Marvel Captain Marvel are going to be in theaters at the same time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, yeah, as I said, like a couple of weeks ago, I found it funny that I got the Captain Marvel trailer followed by Shazam when I went to see Aquaman. <laughs> and you know, it comes out two weeks after Avengers Endgame, right? Pokemon Detective mm. Pikachu. Mm. Oh, I still want to see that thing still. Yes, mm. with Ryan Reynolds as Pikachu. Pikapool. <laughs> you can understand me. <laughs> uh. Oh. And then we start getting into our summer, our, our early summer releases, and those are going to come in hot and heavy, like mm. week after week after week. Like June 7th, Dark Phoenix. June 14th, Men in Black International. June 21st, Toy Story 4. Oh, God, I'm not looking forward to Dark Phoenix. I'm going to avoid that like the plague. <laughs> that poor thing has been in so many reshoots and re cuts and everything yeah. else. Just, I get the feeling so they're thinking... trying to save it, and there's nothing saving it. And by the way, Matt, so you think it'll be as bad as the movie that it's remaking? The week before that is Godzilla <laughs> King of Monsters. <laughs> I need to watch the other two movies. I, matter of fact, I need to get the second one yet. I need to get Kong Skull Island. We're going to fight on sale. I was going to say, I'm like, this is the second one. I wasn't counting Kong, though. And then nope. July 5th is Spider-Man Far From Home. No, no, no. And the Kong mm. Skull Island bill, uh, they literally have uh, tablets that depict uh, Godzilla and others at the end mm. of that one. So yeah, it's part the of the same universe. Is is, yeah, it's... Because it's building to a Kong vs. Godzilla redo. Matter of fact, uh, Skull Island is technically a prequel to the 2014 Godzilla. <laughs> so yeah, enjoy your <laughs> summer of a whole bunch of hits smashed right up against each other trying to compete. <laughs> we got everything much. from android women to giant monsters. Enjoy the fun. Hey, I've got a $100 gift card for Marcus Cinema, so I'm going to be abused in the hell out of that. Um, Bye. We'll, we'll see what it's like to have two Asgardians working in the Men in Black. Uh, <laughs> that'll be interesting. It's eyebrow raising. Mm. All right. Anything else? Uh, no, it would be time for our summary. And looking at our list of who does the summary, it's Tim's turn. Oh boy, my turn. And this is a good episode to do my turn on. All right, so let's uh, get it going. Uh, 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 uh. Yeehaw. <laughs> uh, go, go, go ahead, Mr. Presley. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so uh, is there a clock going? I've got ready whenever you want. Uh, okay. three, as a matter of fact, I'll do a quick countdown. Three, two, one, go. So, Sarah Jane Smith, uh, Ronnie, and Clyde are having a FaceTime chat with uh, Luke, who's off at university. University, And uh, Luke says, hi, uh, I'm just in this episode to say hi, bye. And uh, university is going good, and uh, everything is good. But then there's sad news. Some people in Red Berets come and say, we're from uh, the Unified Intelligence Task Force, and we have sad news. The doctor is dead. And Sarah's like, no, I don't believe it. And and they are like, oh, well, uh, this looks, bears looking into. I know. There's something fishy. So let's all go. And uh, Ronnie's dad says, poor Sarah Jane. She's uh, so in denial. And that's not just a river in Egypt. Ark. But they uh, go uh, to the funeral that's being uh, presented over by of the Doctor, which is being presided over by vulture aliens, the Shanxi, who go around uh, mourning fallen heroes. And the Shanxi story is that they found the Doctor's body on a planet, and they did DNA tests. And to confirm it was him, and he's in a lit-lined coffin, and it's a closed casket funeral, which Sarah Jane says is very suspicious. But the Sanchi says, uh, just sit down, and we'll play this nice harp music, and you can think of the doctor. And so, it's nice, but then there's a loud noise, and everyone wakes up uh, from their remembrances, they open their eyes, and it's Joe Jones. 
who stumbled in and dropped a vase full of flowers. Uh, Sarah Jane and Joe uh, introduce each other, and uh, they become friends rather quickly. Quickly, uh, talking about the doctor. Joe introduces her grandson, Santiago, who was born in Santiago and named after Santiago. Who? Meanwhile, uh, Clyde has been having these electrical b pulses from from the time he touched the TARDIS when the last time he saw the Doctor, which also leads him to think that something is up. up. The kids uh, go sneaking through an air vent, and they find that the Sanchi are planning to drain the brains of Sarah and Joe. Joe. And so they run to tell Sarah and Joe uh, about uh, the Sanchi's evil plan, and this leads them to think that they were right in their suspicions that the Doctor is not dead. Just then, Clyde talks in the Doctor's voice and says, Of course I'm not dead. Dead. Uh, that was established uh, pages ago in the script. Good. Keep up. All of a sudden, the Clyde and the Doctor switch places, and Sarah Jane meets the Doctor's new regeneration in the form of the Eleventh Doctor, and Joe gets to meet the a new regeneration of the Doctor for the first time herself, and the Sanchi uh, appear and zap the Doctor with a laser beam. So Joe. And the Sarah Jane and the kids are all like, oh no! And the doctor, uh, to get rid of the uh, being hit by the laser beam, switches back with, uh, with Clyde. Clyde. And they, after some more switching back and forth, forth, uh, from on a planet of junk and things, the doctor, doctor and uh, Joe and Sarah Jane and Ronnie and Clyde and Santiago all eventually get uh, end up back at on Earth at the base, and they find out that the Shanxi have captured the Doctor's TARDIS. TARDIS and are planning to use the memories of Sarah Jane and Joe Jones to to drain their memories and create a physical duplicate of the key to the TARDIS so they can use the TARDIS to stop people from dying. Which uh, would uh, be a bad... Uh, throw the skelter off the helter in the universe and... So they have to stop that. And the doctor comes up with a brilliant idea and says, you have to remember everything. You have to overload the memory machine. You have to be overdrawn at the memory bank. Think. So, so we get a huge, beautiful montage of classic Doctor Who episodes odes in fast succession, and the whole thing blows up. Up, uh, Sarah Jane and uh, Joe Jones uh, hug it out, and uh, everyone says they're uh, they're see you later's buzz, and uh, the adventure continues. The end. Quick reference: uh, Overdrawn the memory bank also had a Doctor Who joke in it. Well, Julia, in a time warp, essentially, and the comment, Doctor Who the hell cares? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, Tim, you did it in six minutes, 13 seconds. Hmm. I think that's a personal best. <laughs> <laughs> uh, our Tim does have the gift of the gab. Yes. All right. When I get going. So, 
looking at our list of who does what. Bill, you are first. So what did you oh. like about this episode in general? Okay, um, I will say that the continuity references were very tastefully done um, for as a throwback episode. Um, it would be obnoxious if every episode was that way, but this is clearly a special event, and it pulls out all the stops and does it well. All right. Matt? Um, I'm trying to think. I, I uh, in particular, I enjoyed uh, the special effects work in this episode. Some nice transitions when uh, warping between the Doctor and, uh, oh gosh, I keep uh, Clyde. Clyde. Uh, I it's so his name. It's his name. I always have the hardest time with. <laughs> um, and once I get it, I'm good for like the next twenty four hours, and then I'll forget it again. <laughs> uh, but uh, the transitions between the Doctor and Clyde, the uh, the almost like puppet-like look for the uh, aliens this week, and not that that's mm. a bad thing. It was a, a kind of an interesting mix between uh, Muppet Head with uh, full-on body. Mm. Which is odd, but it still worked for them. Yeah. Um, also, uh, probably they probably just squeezed into the corner of a rock quarry or something, but th there was a nice effect with the uh, alien planet for a uh, couple scenes, too. And a nice little map painting when uh, Joe and Sarah were looking off into the horizon at like the nearby other planets to where they were and all this other stuff. So just yeah, just a, an overall interesting mix of decently done uh, uh, effects for, especially considering that this is a children's show and usually the effects are fairly low budget. Mm. All right, Tim. I really liked Matt Smith's uh, performance in this. I actually think that uh, for the children's show, uh, the Eleventh Doctor is a better fit than, uh, than okay. the Tenth Doctor. He's a better fit, but also at the same time, he's a little uh, less manic than usual. Yeah. So this is, I think, the one time that RTD wrote the Eleventh Doctor? Mm -hmm. It is yeah. the only time that RTD wrote the Eleventh Doctor. I mean, so that may uh, may play a small part as well. Possibly. <laughs> But uh, but you, you could uh, see uh, Matt Smith a adjusting his performance, or at least I could notice it uh, for uh, the the different uh, mindset of the show versus his own show. But it still worked, I think. So I give kudos to that. All right. I'll actually say that for a favorite scene. Okay. I was going to mention something, but I'm going to hold on to that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So next would be Thomas. Yep. Uh, thankfully, no one took mine. So I'm going to say that uh, my favorite aspect of this was Katie Manning. Um, Like as Joe. Because just, I don't know, something about it is just like, I have seen this uh, this story before, but watching it again is just, I can't help but smile. And there were things that I will probably mention later that were just fucking heartbreaking as well at the same time. It just, I really wish she'd come back. <laughs> it's like Doctor Who proper now. Because it's like, oh, fucking hell. I, just... I kind of I kinda wish she had taken over the show after uh, Elizabeth Sladen died. That yeah, too. like apparently, apparently that was the idea, but at the same time, I can kind of get why they didn't, because you'd kind of, I don't know, because like, her, I mean, for one thing, you'd have to make her stay in one place, because <laughs> the whole thing is that she goes around the world, so, um, which would be kind of hard to do on a a kid show BBC budget. Mm. All right. Um, all right, that leaves it to me, and you all chose my stuff, damn it. <laughs> um, I really just think the cast in general did a wonderful job. Mm. 
Yeah. I mean, everybody seems to respond to everybody. Just you know, they they react well to everything's going on. They, it works really well. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about what we disliked. And Bill, you're first. I'm going to have to disagree with Matt in that um, this is one of the few episodes where I just facts. I could not shake the idea that this is very clearly a suit or a puppet or, in other words, not an alien that I'm looking at. Like that with the older stuff, but with the newer stuff, they're I think they're usually able to make it look a little less plasticky. Okay. It just all I could see was rubber suit. I guess with the well, I guess with the bird alien, you're not going to be able to um, necessarily maybe do it as well. I don't well, know. Well, I think the problem yeah. is they made it look too much like a vulture. Mm. That so, probably yeah. is part of it. Or yeah. Even mm. thing to so, make it less shiny and more like chicken skin. It's not even that shiny. Not really sure where you're getting shiny from their beaks are shiny, and that's every that's image of the vultures. The skin is very that has that plastic shine to it. I I'm think it's more so the lighting, might be the certain like lighting. In, I don't know, yeah, because they're under a lot of heavy like lighting, have to be for a TV show. Mm. All right, um, Matt. Uh, thing I didn't like about it. Mm-hmm. Um. Oh, I'm trying to think of something I really didn't care about. Um. I guess I didn't like that. Uh, one of the. Uh, I I didn't like that the some of the plot was predictable. Mm-hmm. Like as soon as Sarah Jane had an intuition that something was obviously up, it's almost like, yep, she's right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it would be weird to kill the doctor off in a spin-off show. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but the, but as as, as as she she's already assuming something's up with the weird unit people, she's right. Mm. She thinks there's something up with the weird vulture people. She's right. <laughs> she thinks there's something up with the fact that we can't see the doctor's body. Absolutely, a hundred percent right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Tim, how about you? I really didn't like how uh, they. There were moments when uh, uh, Joe seemed a little green-eyed uh, when uh, Sarah Jane was talking about her adventures with the Doctor. Well, she was in particular green-eyed that the Doctor came back, and honest mm. to God, I think any companion that had been there and left would have had that issue. Mm. Yeah, and to me, yeah. and to me, I never really took it as jealousy so much as disappointment. It's like, oh, mm. he never came back for me, but he did for you. Right. What did I do wrong? That, which I think also leads up to the uh, calling herself stupid in the later scene too. Well, mm. Joe always had the self that little self confidence issue mm-hmm. because yeah. she had, she he only had gotten assigned as the doctor's assistant. Because she had a relative, relatively high up in, uh, in like units command structure, hmm. yeah, that basically forced her in there, or that hmm. that she because she wanted she was a she she wanted to be a spy, yeah, <laughs> and um, so basically her relative I can't remember who it was I think it was like a uh, an uncle or somebody yeah I think it was an uncle basically said okay here talk to this guy and basically sent her to the brigadier and the brigadier mm-hmm. didn't know what the fuck to do with her and sent her to the doctor mm-hmm. she spent all her time around these scientific geniuses but she was too clumsy to be safe in a lab correct mm-hmm. so there was kind of all this stuff going on and then after you know basically two years of uh dealing with the doctor and all his foibles she suddenly finds the, the human equivalent in professor jones and mm-hmm. Mm. Goes running off almost instantly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Gets married, and you still haven't seen the Green Death, have you, Bill? 
I've watched it once. I'm like two thirds of the way through my rewatch, but not enough to have done a review of Shame today. Okay. I didn't realize that I had three hours worth of movies to watch for class today instead of the <laughs> two that I had last week. Mm. That's what happens when you take an online class and they don't do a lecture; they just send you links. <laughs> I was saying it's kind it's it's kind of appropriate to have watched that one. Mm-hmm. Around this, just to mm-hmm. remember where where Joe yeah. last where we last saw yeah. Joe. I I watched. In... Mm. I I watched most of it, just not enough to have been confident giving likes, dislikes, and a rating. Because mm. yeah, it's actually kind of interesting because the version of the Green Death I have actually has this episode on it, and that's how oh. I first saw it. <laughs> oh, oh, nice. Like the, they, the, spe- they, the special they, edition they, release they, of the Green Death. They, they, they added it as an extra. Disc. Yeah. Interesting. Hmm. Huh. Okay. All right. Who are we at? That was Bill. Oh wait. Um. No, I think that was Tim's. We were talking about. Okay. All right, uh, Thomas, what did you dislike? Uh, unit. <laughs> like just, I I hate RTD's obsession with making unit either look stupid, or like corrupt or whatever. Yeah. It's just like fucking hell. Can we just I, not? <laughs> it's okay, like it's one I, thing that I'm kind of glad Moffat hasn't really done. Well, he brought he brought like, back unit with Kate Stewart, and they were decent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was probably one of the best things Moffat did, actually. Yeah, yeah, like uh, it, in like in one of the and then Chip no got rid of them again, <laughs> at least at the moment. Mm. Um, but yeah, yeah but that, just... that was that's that's Chibnall that did that. Yeah. Mm. That's that's our current Balchinian uh, showrunner. Mm. Um, yeah, just and like the fact that oh well, it's this one unit lady who's fucking helping these aliens out. It's like fucking hell. Just can we not? Because <laughs> I have nothing uh, left in this world anymore. Oh yeah. yeah, it's like bloody hell. It was actually kind of. I will give them credit that it was. It would have been worse if the Brigadier was here, because we'd have one person from Unit who was actually competent versus Unit now, which is fucking stupid. <laughs> but yeah. Ah. Oh, that bugged the hell out of me. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to expand on this slightly. Um, And that is that my issue with this is the fact that it, RTD wrote and included most of his tropes. Most of his signature, it was a lot campier than your average episode. But there was no pig person. <laughs> there, there. Um, we suddenly had the return of the Grask aliens, just with a different color schema, mm. which was another thing that RTD put all over the place. Yeah, and yeah, yes, right. unit being the bad guys or incompetent or both. Mm. In this case, they, both. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they were incompetent to stop an obvious alien plot going on amongst their midst, and one of their own members was evil and helping these aliens. Mm. Yep. It's just something that you... Remember I've talked on and on and on about Moffat's tropes. Mm. Things that you could tell with the way Moffat wrote stuff that you're just like, oh yeah, yeah, okay. And that's how you can tell this is RTD because mm-hmm. Muta is stupid. <laughs> Although <laughs> the uh, a Moffat trope that I'm going to be mentioning later. <laughs> oh, uh, my least favorite scene. Mm, uh. Okay. All right. Um. Anyway, that does that. That well. Guess what, Bill? Favorite scene. All right. So my favorite scene. Uh, I'm going to uh, the second, but I'm going to go with uh, this one, and that was uh, the Doctor's arrival. I just think that scene was kind of like, I think I said the same thing about the last episode, but yeah, the, the Doctor's arrival into the episode was flawless. 
It was very mm. Matt Smithy too. <laughs> and you know, yeah. considering this was written by Russell T, I I was surprised by that. Mm -hmm. mm. Could be that Russell understood Matt Smith's doctor better than Moffat did. Well, mm. it was also by this point Matt had been in long enough where if uh, the dialogue was wrong due to an unfamiliar writer, he could tweak it a bit and add his own. Yeah, touch. this was after, yeah. The, if you listen to the dialogue, this was post uh, Matt's first season, post season five. Yeah. So they'd already blown apart the universe and put it back together. <laughs> and happened prior to a Christmas Carol, that abomination. <laughs> That's a thing. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, um, uh, Matt, what was your favorite scene? Um, do I want to go with that one? I'll go with um the Doctor bringing Joe and uh, Sarah onto an alien planet, and they're just literally having a moment together, just going. <gasps> It's been so long since I've been on an alien planet. Oh, God, look at that horizon. And did you literally even have a moment where the doctor turns around like he's about to ask them for something and just goes, oh, enjoying the moment, sure. And then he goes right back to work with a smile. <laughs> All right. Uh, Tim. Uh, well, that was uh, practically mine, but uh, <laughs> I have a... Back up. Uh, going that I did like uh, the scene where uh, uh, Santiago and Ronnie and Clyde uh, uh, are uh, doing their own uh, uh, getting to know each other scene. Scene talking about the adventures they're having and. Uh, especially Clyde and Santiago are like uh, comparing like who's had the mo the more adventurous life, <laughs> life, and and Ronnie says, in the end we're both we're both uh, fighting for what we believe in sort of things you know and so that was a good scene I think. All right. Mm -hmm. Thomas. Yeah, Matt came. Dangerously close to taking mine, but thankfully he cut off the moment <laughs> that I wanted. So it it is absolutely, um, Joe having that like mild, like just Joe getting like sad when she realizes, oh, you've got a married couple on the TARDIS. I left you because I was getting married, and the whole was I just stupid and stuff. Because I can tell you. Even just thinking about that now hits me emotionally. Like I don't know exactly what it is, but some I legit rewatching it last night or really early this morning, whenever it was. I'm surprised that I didn't completely break down and cry, but there was definitely tears. Like just something about how Katie Manning sells that for me, mm. and like the Doctor having to be like, "Hey." stop beating yourself up i've like you know um in a way that he comforts her and it's just like uh, i mm, just something about it yeah it's just like even talking about it now it's like <clears throat> hit me in the gut all right so my favorite scene is the one at the very end where sarah jane is talking about all the companions that she's checked up on mm -hmm. And mm. she, you know, brings up um, Tegan. She brings up Harry Sullivan. And she brings up Ace. And she brings up Ian and Barbara. And Ben and Polly. And it's just like... Mm. Kind of, it's the, the final, the good job for all the companions over the years. And I thought that was great. Yeah. Mm. So... And, of course, they used the uh, Charitable Earth thing again when they did the whole Ace coming back in class, which we hmm. did a couple weeks back. That's right. They did <laughs> use, reuse that, didn't they? Yes, they did. They, they tied it all together. Yes, they did. <laughs> That's if a big not finish for, this... for, you, for you with one big, wonderful bow. 
not for the scene that you just mentioned, kind of fixing the future, would Ace still be on Gallifrey? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I mean, of course, the the class thing tried to tie it all together, but mm. yeah. Um. Anyway, from here we go to our least favorite scene, and Bill. So mine is kind of around the same period of the uh, sub. Uh, at the point when the doctor starts talking about his own death and you realize that this is probably a scene written by Moffat for the Trenzalore plot. Oh, ah! right. We're foreshadowing Trenzalore. No. No, that's not the vibe I got at all. No. Mm -hmm. it's, mo it's more closer to the 10th doctor talking about his death and end of time. The, um... The whole death thing uh, and Trenzalore hadn't been thought up at this point. It's still a season ahead of us. Because we have... A couple seasons, whole... actually, yeah. No, no, no. It's It gets foreshadowed at the end of Series 6. Oh. Which at this point is basically Moffat still doing the, the, the River Song World Tour series. Uh... The abomination that was Series 6. I don't know. The whole thing about... <laughs> the whole universe will show up that sounded like it was linked to Moffat's various. I don't it wasn't fully. Really I could just this, take this, it as the this, doctor this, being jerkingly arrogant, but this might've started the ball rolling on the doctor's going to die trope that just hmm. wouldn't die because Moffat wouldn't <laughs> let it die. Mm -hmm. Even though he should kill that after the first season of attempting that. Because that is actually, mm. it's not Trenzalore that he'd be hinting at. It might be the... Um, oh, it uh, might have been the... Uh, Lake the, Silence. Yeah, like the silence and stuff, yeah. yeah. Impossible. Actually, True. Yeah. If if it were earlier, I would have said it was hinting for the Pandorica, but it's too late for that. Yep. <laughs> that but he, happened, he, yeah. If, he was, if it was fishing for anything, it would have been that. But Moffat didn't have any direct control over Sarah Jane Adventures. Yeah, like the Even only real direct Who? thing. Mm -hmm. Even though it was uh, part of Doctor Who. No, it was still under. Um, it was Russell. still under Russell. Yeah. yeah. He carried it on um, for one last season. I, I, like I get, yeah. he was the direct showrunner, but I was under the impression that Torchwood showrunner and SJA showrunner still answer to the Doctor Who showrunner. They maybe get some hints um, if they need a crossover for something, but I don't think they like take all of their cues from them. Though no. they 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 usually mm. uh, they usually you know put their heads together. Yeah, mm. uh, they they uh, actually compare notes and go, "Here's how you fix that and make it tie into my show for this next season." There. Yeah, yeah. but no, um, the uh, Moffat never had any direct control over it. Uh, the executive Plus, producers for this season were still Russell T. Davies and Nikki Wilson. Plus, like, Which, death foreshadowing only really happened in, like, literally the last one <laughs> we covered because it was, like, timely. Like, the the, the off-mention, the trickster makes of events that happened in um, End of Time. Which is, like, an offhand thing that Doctor's like, wait, what? But, um, oh yeah, the previous one was yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But this was firmly that's been firmly because both of the shows were under Russell. Yeah, yeah. So the first few series of Sarah Jane Adventures, the executive producers were Russell T Davies and Julie Gardner. Uh, um, Julie Gardner left at the end of series three. Um. And Nikki Wilson, who had just been a producer, got pro uh, promoted to executive producer. Um, starting with Series 5, uh, the executive producers were still Russell T. Davies and, Nick and Nikki Wilson. Under, mm -hmm. In no way did um, um, Moffat ever get, in the, uh, get any input into Sarah Jane Adventures. At least that not seems weird because input. what if um, his doctor and the Doctor Who doctor contradicted one another or something? Well, I'm Oops. pretty sure for for this, um, probably at that point, what would happen was Russell T sat down 
and basically sat down with Stephen Moffat and went, okay, we're doing this for Sarah Jane Adventures. Mm -hmm. Um, and that again, they did actually contradict each other because there's a throwaway line, um, that Clyde asked the doctor, how many times can you regenerate? And he says something like 502. I thought that yeah, was canonically it says a joke. 507. Yeah, yeah, it's canonically a joke. It's a it's an in joke by the writers and also because I mean, to be I, the doctor joking around. I know that R2D he, was a, he, would have been a hundred percent aware of um, mm -hmm. which of course the funny thing is that does seem more like a Moffat thing to do, that kind of a joke. <laughs> it's him being it was uh, for me it looked like the doctor just kind of being flippant, like so okay, yeah, right, basically. stop asking questions. Mm. Basically, yeah. he's being flippant because he was also having being asked a million questions while running backwards in a tiny, yeah. tiny in square. Event, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's probably having enough trouble just trying to keep up with the kids trying to go backwards. Mm. Then he's got Clyde right in front of him, just asking him a million questions. Yeah. yeah. Being the curious boy that he is. But mind you, the fan base kept that as canonical for like two years. <laughs> really? Yes! Oh my god. Uh, it might even just be why like, Moffat went out of his way to be like, no, 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 it's still 12. Regeneration. But yeah, it was just one of those things. It's, it's like the stupid pool in the library off, you know, offhand remark. Mm. And for years, the fan base is like, oh, yeah, he has this huge library with a pool in the middle. No! No, the water <laughs> from the pool ended up in the library. Correct! So there's a <laughs> so there's probably floating bookcases right now. And I'm pretty sure that Moffat knew, you know, at, about, uh, af, you know, about that point that he would need to correct that by the time Journey to the Center of the TARDIS came out, which is why there was a pool room and a library room. <laughs> Just so he could go, finally, yes, and, they're separate fucking mm, rooms. Get it. I mean, hell, there's apparently, like, a fourth Doctor story where there's a pool in the TARDIS somewhere. So. Oh, yeah, the yeah, invasion of we've time. We've seen it before, yeah. Mm. The TARDIS has regenerated since then. That pool was, <laughs> was uh, ejected from the TARDIS in the Seventh Doctor era, because it sprung a leak. Oh, that's right. Or Actually, no, didn't he drop it because he needed to lose weight for something? No, no, it's because it sprung a leak. It's listed at the beginning of um, uh, Paradise Towers. Ah. I, I thought, like, the Fourth or Fifth Doctor needed a to drop things. A quarter of the TARDIS was removed due to trying to escape from that um, uh, paradox bubble left by the Master. But that quarter included the zero room and unknown architecture. Oh. But hmm. they would state later during the seventh Doctor era that he ejected the pool the pool because it sprung a leak. Not that again he could just go into the TARDIS and eventually reprogram a new pool anyway. Well, I, it's the TARDIS would eventually grow a new pool. It probably grew a new zero room too. It just takes time. Mm -hmm. The TARDIS yeah. is big enough there were probably three or four pools in it at one point. <laughs> just have the eject pool number three because it sprung a leak. Considering it has multiple <laughs> console rooms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And apparently the TARDIS <laughs> just keeps the old one as spares somewhere below. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's just, you know, the TARDIS is... The TARDIS is more like a plant than a, than a machine. It, <laughs> it, it grows... <laughs> It, it's kind of both. They're, they're, they're pretty much are grown like the uh, Transformers are. Okay, so whose least favorite scene were we on? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's mine. Or did we go on? Okay, okay. Tim, go on. All right, my least favorite scene was the scene where... The first scene where they're in the 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 ventilation shaft and they stumble across the Shang-Chi's evil plan and it's like everything becomes they're in molasses for some reason it's like oh no we have to get out of here oh no my hand is glowing again that'll give us away i better hold it up so and, and wait for them to see it oh oh now we have to argue about how there's no room to move 
to turn around. <laughs> yeah, well, but, just, yeah I, I can understand why the two kids behind Clyde couldn't understand. Get the hell back. <laughs> All right. Uh, I mean, it, it's all like uh, so heavy-handed. I think. Mm -hmm. All right, Thomas. By the way, I think I got um, skipped. What's that? I think I got skipped. Did I do a, a worse scene? Thought you did. Mm. Thought you said you did it. Oh, I'm sorry. If I if might I, have been uh, that we got hung up on bills on an hour. I think we yeah, got hung up on bills. I'm um, trying to remember my least case. favorite really quick. Um. I remember doing the least favorite overall thing. Um, trying to think really quick. Love least favorite scene. Um, I would have to go with uh, uh, obvious villain is obvious uh, when the uh, unit gal reveals herself to be working with the uh, aliens and. Mm. Oh, I couldn't have guessed that all along. <laughs> yeah. The only right, unit character we've actually credit. had dialogue with, and you're the bad guy. Ooh. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyways, like, so if it yeah, had Thomas. turned out being some other random, then maybe that it would have been fine. But... Yeah. Or or if it was just um, aliens working on their own and they did fool her somehow. But yeah. There was yeah. Like... Or like she was hypnotized or something. That's a possibility too, because they have that ability. Or if there mm. was an actual, like, an, a, a unit character with a name and face we recognized that was working with her, and then she all of a sudden, like, surprised them, and like, ah, you thought I was your protege, but I was an alien agent all along. Mm. Yeah, That would have been more original, too, yeah. Oh, well. Because, yeah, I'm pretty sure last time they did, like, ooh, there's an evil guy in unit. It's like, just turned out that the, the dude was like an alien or possessed by an alien or something who'd infiltrated unit. Um, but yeah, like, I'm pretty much going to have to like, a couple times. yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much just tagging on the mats because that's basically all I had as well. So, <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't like, know. I so sorry for stealing your thunder. That was my idea too. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> like it was like the closest I could think of to anything. So, it's fine. All right. So my least favorite scene is what I'm going to define as obvious space is obvious. <laughs> oh. <laughs> they they you're going to base five in Mount Snowden. Okay. First of all, Mount Snowden is probably one of the most famous mountains in Wales. <laughs> it is a recreational kind of like ski resort mountain. Um, in northern Wales, northern Wales, uh, in what's called Snowdonia National Park, it's you know like saying let's take you know like Mount Shasta or Bear Mountain in California and put a freaking base on one side. <laughs> Going to do that? Shouldn't it have had like a cloak or something? But well, no, right. they're, I mean, they're driving. No. They're driving up to it like it's the freaking um, NORAD base in Wyoming. Hmm. I mean, even Torchwood I mean, had like right in the center of city bases, but it was like you know you had to go through this side entrance sort of a deal to get in. Or you had to find the uh, one of two else. underground entrances, and they were disguised as other things, mm -hmm. so it wasn't as mm. obvious, and you could easily lose people. Yeah, yeah, you would have thought they would have had like a perception filter on it or something. At the very so, least, a perception filter, yeah. Instead, it was, you know, big freaking obvious base, which I thought was kind of... Uh, literally, yeah. yeah, you just literally had the side of a mountain and it had like a tower and a mm -hmm. ob obvious, bu obvious building block kind of thing. And it's just like, oi. <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, that just seems uh, a little obvious, guys. And mm. again, this is because Russell T. writes Unit as being a bunch of idiots. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he can't write them without being the, making them buffoons somehow. Mm. Okay. So... Now we're up to our reviews, and I believe Bill's first. Yep. Um. Okay. So I. Uh, 
this was a good episode as a uh as you know as a reference to the past uh i think it especially would have been good if they had um known what was coming and they had kind of planned it as a handoff this would have been a perfect episode uh to hand off from sarah jane to joe unfortunately that's not how it actually ended up go happening or if it were just like a full finale that was also referencing you know all of sarah jane's history uh uh Speaking of which, one scene I did not mention, but that I uh, really got a chuckle out of was the uh, doctor uh, pointing out the ventilation shaft to Sarah Jane, which, of course, is one of their most favorite, most famous scenes together as the fourth doctor. (laughs) Uh, Other than the other than the uh, continuity bits, uh, eh, not quite as strong. Um, Joe, I mean, Joe is kind of in between being continuity or a new thing. And she's great. She's like halfway between young Joe and Iris wild time. And if she had gone any f- closer to Iris, it would have been too much. It would not have been good, I think, but I think this was just, just enough that it was good. All right. But, um, yeah. So the, there were some wonky bits otherwise, but, uh, mostly good episode. Okay. Matt. Outside of my one major big complaint being that obvious villains are obvious, uh, for a kids' show, that's not a, the most horrible thing ever. And uh, for giving that a little bit, the rest of the episode is a really good romp. Uh, the, the villains are a little bit awkward at times, but they at least come up with something to do. They managed to out-trick the Doctor and stole his TARDIS. And they are trying to now use his friends to try and make a key so that they can basically bend and break the rules of the universe which is not a bad plan for a villain if you can actually get all the way through um Mm. uh the kids were uh again relatable as kids and also there were some uh touches of real world before they left for the big funeral uh like i believe it was uh ronnie's father brought up the fact that uh i think it was his uh mother or uh, uh, somebody else that uh, someone else in the family that couldn't quite get uh, realize the fact that someone else was permanently gone when they passed away too, mm. that kind of thing. So I, I like the fact that Sarah Jane hits those real world notes every once in a while and does it in a, uh, at least a understandable and uh, good light uh, and tries to make mm. sense of them. Um. Also, on top of that, uh, the action pieces were at least somewhat interesting. We had a few good comical moments, but they didn't go completely overwhelmingly over the top like this would happen in the uh, 11th Doctor series once in a while. And um, overall, the uh, the main characters were really well done and very likable. And it's kind of a shame that they haven't brought back Joe and her grandson yet, because they could easily come back as far as I'm concerned. Mm. Especially since Iron Fist is over now. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> <laughs> that, by the way, I forgot to mention that that is who Santiago grew up to be, guys. He's Iron Fist. Mm. He's Iron Fist. He's also, he's the immortal he's Iron also Fist. um, God, what is? I can't remember the character's name for the life movie, but it was also in Game of Thrones. Or Loras. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Mm. So a lot of these people are still act. A lot of these kids are still what? actors, and they're now well into their mm. early, uh early adulthood, so you can bring them back any time, make them regular companions or something, you know? Mm. Or, or maybe do a spin-off somehow. Yep. Either way, it's possible. Name, by the way, is Finn Jones. Yep. Finn Jones. That's it. And I did not realize that was him. Loris Terrell in Game of Thrones. I can, see, and... I can see it a little bit now that you mentioned it. And yeah. Danny Rand in Iron Fist. He's also done a few other minor roles here and there, mm. but those are really his uh, claim to fame is the Game of Thrones and Iron Fist, the Defenders, Luke Cage, which, as mm. we know, is done now. So, yep, mm-hmm. Netflix is officially canned everything. In case you anybody out there didn't know yet. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot to mention that. Yeah, Netflix just canned the last two shows now. So. They're still releasing the season three of uh, Jennifer Jones, and that's going to end it. Yep. They're just going to hold on to those licenses until those licenses give up, and then they'll send everything back to Disney. From what I've heard, it's a two-year waiting period. Um, 
Mm. So got about two years to try and catch up. Contract (laughs) runs out, and that's when Marvel can use them again. Mm. So that's why they're speculated to be in Phase Four. Ah, would be nice. Anyway, uh, so the uh, yeah, outside of the again, the obvious villains are obvious. Most of the rest of this, I'm perfectly fine with. It's not the best and it's not the worst in some spots, but there are definite major highlights that just wipe away almost everything. Almost. I'm good. All right. So, uh, Tim. I really enjoyed this episode. It was uh, great seeing uh, Joe uh, again. Uh, t- Katie Print was uh, pretty uh, pretty spot on, as well as the uh, the new interactions between the new characters and old. Old, the set pieces were good. I had no problem with the uh, puppet vulture aliens. By the and... way, can I say just I have to interrupt really quickly, Tim. I find it adorable. You called her Katie Grant. Yes, I, I noticed that. <laughs> uh, Manning, something. Kay Manning is her real name. Uh, Joe Grant is her character. Yeah. And now Joe Jones. Is now Joe character. Jones, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, do continue. Uh, the vultures? Uh, the the vultures were uh, okay with me. I actually th- uh, think yeah, I, I, uh, I prefer the puppet puppets to uh, if they had tried to uh, CG or more oh, modern yeah. special effects. Yeah, I could have used a touch it, of CG to make them a little more lively. Yep, yep. But uh, that's neither here nor there. Uh, the references to the other companions were good, but it seems that they were sort of boxing themselves in by mentioning that uh, Ian and Barbara had never aged. So yeah, that, uh, They did mention it was a rumor. Yeah. It was mm-hmm. a rumor only, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, we'll see. Uh, I hope they don't go the uh, Star Wars Rogue One d- oh, God. pushing no, thing. No, 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 don't even suggest thing. that. Yeah. First, if, first if of they all, did, the BBC I mean, doesn't have the budget the... for it. Yeah. Number two, no. Is, isn't the rule of CGI yeah. that if you can do it in a big budget movie, wait five years and you can afford to do it on TV? Oh, no. no We've only got about two more mo- years left. <laughs> yep. But uh, this was a happy episode that I really enjoyed, is my final thing. Mm. Um, yeah, like as, as far as I'm concerned. I am kind of glad that I've seen more now of... Because, like, when I had originally seen uh, Death of the Doctor, I had only seen, like, a bit of Joe Grant. Um, or at least, I don't think it, it the episode impacted me as much when I first saw it after watching The Green Death. But now, um, and I guess also not having any grandparents anymore, my um, my last grandparent who was alive died on Saturday... Um, oh. that, I guess, it. I feel like it might have been something like that that was also resonating with me in some way, which is weird because we haven't lost Katie Manning yet. Um, mm, true. I mean, knock on wood, we haven't yet. Um, but, uh, but yeah, just something about this time around, Katie Manning just really hit me. I really wish, my God, the more I thought about it, while we still have Jody, bring Joe back. Like, please. That would be hilarious. Like, I feel like those two would play off each other very well. Um, Jody and Joe? Yeah. <laughs> that, would be a, that would just be a great episode, Jody and Joe. <laughs> Jody? Um, Brain is not quite connecting. Doctor. Jody Whitaker? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Have 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 the current doctor. Have the current doctor. The have current doctor, doctor meet Joe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. First of all, I'd um, love to see it completely blow Joe's mind for yes, like you know, five minutes. Yeah. Just have the whole mental short circuit. And then after a few moments, just have her go. 
And why do you look like you could be my granddaughter? <laughs> and then just yeah. and then just have her shrug and <laughs> shrug and I would what? Love, I would love to see that with any of the old companions. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it would be it would be interesting to see the reaction from any of the old companions. Just go, doctor. And now I know this. Could, I know this could never happen on screen now, but I'm just trying to imagine uh, Harry Sullivan's reaction to that now. Oh God! Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> how's how's this doing for your sides? I uh... honest to God, though, just keeping it in the modern family. I do want to see Jody Whittaker meet Captain Jack Harvest. I was just thinking that too. It's like oh, I want to see Jody meet <laughs> Captain Jack. <laughs> uh, um, I want yeah, um, to. I, I can't wait Jack to see him just suddenly go wide eye and go, "Oh!" <laughs> and then discover it's the Doctor, and then just go, "Ah, it's fair. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fair call." Uh, um, but yeah, like the, I feel like the only thing that almost was kind of like, uh, it would have been so interesting to see is Liz Shaw in this would have been kind of nice, even if she was only like briefly in it, but it's just, you would have had the only three Pertwee companions together on screen. That yeah, would have, that in itself would have been, been amazing. I, yeah. I think the problem is Carolyn John died. Actually, she died shortly uh, after. 2012, so she was, not in so good she was half. still alive. Yeah, this was, yeah. yeah this she might have not been doing like physically well. Yeah. And within this a short time after this died. episode, was this before we lost the brig? This was before uh, we lost the brig. We lost before, the we lost the brigadier, and we lost Sarah Jane time. in the same year. Yeah. Yeah. What month each was, or whatever. Mm-hmm. I'm actually trying to figure out what. Uh, so oh, he died. died. She died from cancer. Mm. So Nicholas Courtney died about two months after a Christmas Carol. Um, they could always bring back Cyber Brig. It, I guess, it really that depends on, on what kind of cancer and how long her treatment was. Oh, and Elizabeth Sladen was two months after the Brigadier. Mm-hmm. And this was the following year. After I'm calling him the Brigadier, you know who I'm, you know I'm talking about, Nick Courtney. <laughs> and yeah, Car- Caroline John was another year after, so she may or may not have been. You know. It depends on the type of mm-hmm. cancer and the duration of the treatment. Yeah, yeah, because like they, they, I, I am glad though. In at, at the very least, that they mention her. Like I didn't even catch it at first. I had to rewind, and they say that Liz Shaw, Miss Shaw, couldn't be here because she's stuck on the moon base. Yep. Yep. Which is like okay, so they at least mention. Her, Although I, nice. I hear that, yeah. and my brain started playing the theme from uh, 1980. <laughs> See, I heard you that, and I started playing the, the uh, 1960s Cyberman UFO. theme. No, the the theme from UFO, where the the secret government agency had a moon base. Mm. I'm just waiting to hear that they have a Cyberman issue up there. <laughs> All right. Uh, where were we anyway? Who's I, uh, that, that was, that that was, was yeah. So that was Timothy. Yeah. All right. So I, it's up to my oh, final Thomas. thoughts then. Yeah. All right. So, um, this episode does a great job of taking uh, little bits and pieces left in previous episodes, tying them together, bringing back um, a classic companion. Um, and reuniting it with a modern doctor in just a way that actually works very well. It does suffer a little bit of tropism because of the writer, but, you know, if you've dealt with series one through four of Doctor Who, you're used to that and can deal with most of it. Uh, The villains are pretty obvious, but the storyline gets gets a good interesting, enough that it gets, I think, in my, my mind, a pretty good pass, and it's a very enjoyable episode. All right, ratings. So, Bill, you are first in the ratings box. I'm thinking 4.0. Four? Mm-hmm. All right. Um, Matt? I have to agree. I'm giving this one a four. Okay. Uh, Tim? I'm bringing the sunshine and giving this a five. <laughs> of course you are. Thomas? <laughs> Well, I I I wanted to be the high one, 
So you know what? Fuck the problems that I had with this. I am going to agree with Tim. I'm giving this a five as well. <laughs> My. Yes. Google gobble, Google gobble, one of us, one and of us. I am going to give this a four and a half, because I think that the... Uh, the oh positive... my, I'm a lobby for a change. Yes, you are. You and Bill <laughs> are the Doubting Thomases. <laughs> and that, by the way, will average out to prove I am correct! Yep. <laughs> wow. Get rid of the high scores and the low scores. Oh gee, I wonder which one's left. It's a uh, 4.5. Uh, 4.5 directly, so taking it to the ratings. Damn, that's going to be pretty high. Yeah, it's going to be fairly high. And don't forget the ratings update for, um, what was it now? Uh, the Gift. The Gift, the yeah. Gift. Okay, before we start, the Gift, I think, was in the 3.6 range. Yes. Actually, mm. it was on the border between 3.7 and 3.6 at... Uh, 172. So, now we sort the data. And... The gift goes up to 169. Meanwhile... Uh, at 4.5. Left up three Death spots. Of the Doctor is at number 42. Oh. <laughs> out of 283 things currently reviewed. It so... is 42. Death of the <laughs> Doctor is the meaning of life, the universe, and everything? At the, for this week, anyway. We'll see what happens after next week. It is on par with Rosa, the woman who fell to Earth. War Machines, Spare Parts, The Invasion, The Rebos Operation, Thin Ice, World Enough in Time, The Doctor Falls, Resolution, A uh, Thousand Worlds, Heart of the Battle, Enlightenment, New Earth, Zygon Invasion, Zygon Inversion, and Utopia, Here Comes the Drums, Last of the Time Lords. It is better than uh, Torchwood Ghost Machine, Class, The Medical Metaphysical Engine, or What Quill Did, The Eleventh Hour. Wow, it's better than The Eleventh Hour. Mm -hmm. Rise of the Cybermen, Age of Steel, Partners in Crime, The Time Warrior, uh, Face the Raven, The Battle of Ranscor of Kolos, Husbands of River Song, Suntaran Stratagem, The Poison Sky, Terror of the Zygons, and The War Games, but it is not as good as, and this is a lot smaller list, Seeds of Death, Talons of Wang Chiang, Arachnids in the UK, The Ghost Monument, The Invasion of Time, the Magician's Apprentice, The Witch is Familiar, The Return of Dr. Mysterio, and The Bells of St. John. So there we have it, number 42 of 283. That's all we have to say about Sarah Jane Adventures, The Death of the Doctor. All right, uh, those listening, don't forget to uh, comment at the bottom. Let us know what you think about uh, The Death of the Doctor. Um, and don't forget to follow us on Twitch or subscribe to us on YouTube. Or, of course, to like or follow on Facebook and Twitter. Or both, I guess. All right. So with that, that ends our tribute to uh, Liz Sladen. Uh, we will be continuing with the Cranium of Chibnall next week as we jump over to the other spinoff, Torchwood, with Torchwood Countryside. Written by Chris Chibnall and starring John Barrowman as Captain Jack Harkness, Eve Miles as Gwen Cooper, Byrne Gorman as Owen Harper, Naoko Mori as Toshiko Sato, and Gareth David Lloyd as Ianto Jones. So we'll see you with that next week. All right. See... Have a good night. Good night, bye. Go right to bed, bugs, bite. Creepy.